form of equity in the companies we were starting and in our company as we built it. So actually, and I loved that. I loved that symmetry. Because I honestly, I'd never done anything in life where if I worked hard, it hadn't worked out somehow. And, and I wanted to, I was totally happy to trade off being high current income for a, for a share in whatever I could produce. Totally happy. That was an easy decision for me. That's just me. It may not be the same for everybody. But that was, I, I would take that deal any day and I still would. So um, that's really where I think, um, where I would answer your question is um, not just is there some money to earn, but how do you make it? And is it tied to your own efforts? That makes it all the more rewarding and, and I think, frankly, makes the upside much, much bigger. Yes? Uh, what happened to the first book that you wrote and what, what changed the second time around when you tried? Wonderful question. What happened to that first book? Ah, uh, yes. Um, <clears throat> well, you know, the funny thing about all those rejections, um, having those 32 rejections was really, it felt like a big setback at the time. And oh, by the way, uh, just last summer, I, I, I got a request from that very same publisher who sent me the Dear Sir slash Madam, uh, from a totally different person, of course, but the same publisher asking me to edit a new edition of a fantasy collection that they want to put out. And I felt so <laughs> great. <laughs> you know, I'm just so overwhelmed. I've got three books coming out and a movie in production. And, uh, I just, I'm sorry, I just don't have time to edit your friggin' little book. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it felt fabulous. It felt fabulous. It was great. So, uh, Man, that was an email I, I just uh, waited a decade to get to send again. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> but, uh, but the thing is that, that that experience I now realize uh, was a good one because for two reasons. One was, uh, that novel sucked. <laughs> it deserved to get all those rejections. Um, how do I put it more plainly? I had a lot to learn about storytelling. I was... You know, <clears throat> I was as about as far away from J.R.R. Tolkien as we are from the planet Neptune, okay? <laughs> and and I needed to be pushed back to 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 say, okay, you know, what do I need to learn about this crap? There's a lot to learn, and by the way, it's one of the things I love the best about writing, is that there's always more to learn. It's one of those um, one of those lines of work where there's an ever receding horizon of what you can learn, what you can, how you can grow, what, you know, what can be done better. I think it's very much um, uh, like the best, the best jobs are like that. But at the same time, the other thing that I learned was even more important, which was that seven years, really ten years later, because there was business school, and by the way, I did a JD MBA, so it was a, a four-year gap there. Um, so 10 or 11 years later, I was still, in the face of all of those rejections, nothing published, no evidence that I could ever read something somebody might enjoy to read, I still was yearning to try it. Now that was the important thing, and it took me a while to warm up to that, to realize, you know, here, I've got no reason to go that way, but I'm still getting up early in the morning to try it. I'm riding in the back of taxi cabs. I'm doing character sketches on some of these people in meetings, imagining they thought I was taking copious notes about everything that was going on, but I was really trying to imagine what they turned into on Saturday nights. So. <laughs> it was really, really fun. <laughs> but, um, and all, you know, keeping it all together, they had no clue of this, but my, my, my point is um, that I was still going there in my head. It finally dawned on me, because I'm not, I wasn't as, 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 as savvy as, as you guys. You guys would have figured this out pretty quickly. It took, it took me that 10 or 11 years, but I realized, you know, that is a really important message. And whatever time I've got, I really don't want it to be split like that. And, and so I, I, I realized, okay, I want to give this, this uh, really terrific job in a, t in a traditional financial 
mix it up business realm that I'm, I'm enjoying and, and, and learning a ton, but it's only using a little slice of my brain and none of my heart. I want to give it a while so I really can wrap my arms around what I can learn. I want to complete the promises I've made to people I care about, and I want to earn whatever dough I can make. And so, you know, optimize that. And then I, but I, I really, I really want to go there and find out what, what is it about this writing gig that is so compelling, and see if I actually could do it with that intervening time. So that's really the answer to your question. Thank you for asking. Yes? So I'm from Colorado also and feel a strong sense of desire to go home there. So when you changed to the writing piece, you also chose, it seems, to go back to Colorado. I'm curious what sense of place and um, obviously you care about nature, but how that affected your decision. Yeah, well, I, I, care. I think place is hugely um, not just as a writer, but as, as human beings, we, we can so easily um, get, get um, reduced into um, an inner space that's, that's exciting, compelling, and, 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 and powerful gravity, but it, it can be only as big as that device in your hand, or only as, as deep as that, that electronic screen, and and it's really, it's just so important. And honestly, I can't say it nearly as well as Brooks did today in his talk. But it's, it's that connection with nature that really draws you out of all that. It gives, it gives you a chance, a chance to reconnect with what really is important in your heart. What really makes you go the distance. What really makes you feel fully alive. And it's those... Those places, whatever they are, the natural world, there's something just so welcoming and, and accepting about being in nature. And, and it's for that reason, by the way, that when I write books, and I think this is especially important if you write about imaginary worlds, as I do, I, I view place not just as a backdrop against which the story takes place, not just the postcard picture, I think place has to step forward and actually have all the fullness of a character. Place is actually a form of character in my books. And it's not just because I'm a nature lover, enviro type. I, it's really because I think place has to be that real to engage, a, a fully engage a bright, intelligent reader. And that's the kind of world we can all enter into especially if it's an imaginary world. You can bend the rules in an imaginary world, but it has to be totally real in all those linguistic and cultural and historical and philosophical ways. But, but now, um, back to Colorado. I will say I had another big advantage, which was um, a very eager pair of kids, Brooks and his sister, who we really did not want to grow up in New York City. We had just started having kids. And while, you know, little Brooks was, was still, you know, about the size of a bread box, um, it was going to be clear that very soon he was going to be out exploring the world. And we, we knew we didn't want that to happen on the streets of New York City. We wanted it to happen in a place where nature really could be his, his friend and a place where, that we'd invite him to explore and... The rest is history, if you know Brooks. So, um, so uh, honestly, I give a lot of credit to Brooks and his sister Denali for giving us a powerful incentive to not just, when, when I left my job, to not just stay there, but to go to a place that both inspire my writing, I hoped, but also be a wonderful place for our kids to grow up. Turned out it's done pretty, pretty well on that front. So, uh, that's the answer to your question. So get yourself back to Colorado. <laughs> that's, the, that's the real bottom line. How about, how about one or two more questions, and then I think we should wrap it up so that you all can have your, have your suppers. How about you? Um, so I was curious about the role of narrative in understanding your own life. Because I was so struck by that you made this decision to 
leave New York and go right and never look back. I don't think I've ever made a decision that I've never looked back mm -hmm. on. Do you think there was a role in just telling yourself, like, this is my story, I'm going for it, like, I'm never looking back, or do it, like, has it genuinely always felt that way? No, uh, no, I, I, I did not have that. I did not have that um, super view of my life as a, as a narrative. I really didn't. What I did know, though, I, I, what that was really a statement about was that I think I had been suffering enough in those years, not or incomplete enough, and therefore having some personal anguish about that, struggles around that, and self-aware enough that I was, I knew that was happening. That that's why. When it when when it when I went for it, when I had to take that step, but then I really I haven't had any looking back. Even in the even in the questionable times, that first two years before that next book, the next book that got published, the first one that actually did get published, uh, you know there were big questions about whether this was all going to work. But you know what I knew. Look, if it didn't work, I'd I'd end up doing something different. I might I I I, I did sometimes think about. Uh, well, if it doesn't work, what's my plan B or C? I could farm. I, I thought about forming another fund of my own, but based in Boulder, Colorado. I thought they would focus on environmental companies and, and outdoor recreation companies. I thought about doing um, uh, a stint at, at, in an NGO, a conservation group, at, at, you know, and, and running that. Uh, I, I, I definitely. I even interviewed for uh, one of those jobs, uh, and I. You know, I thought about other things too, but I, I so I, I had some plans B and C going, but I really, really, really needed to give this a try. It happens to have worked out really well. So I, did, well, I didn't look back. I did look sideways some, uh, and I, and I, I don't think I actually think it's important not to, not to have that forward-looking narrative too too clear in your mind because life does give you tremendous opportunity for surprises and growth. But do you remember? When I pose those two questions, one that looks inside, one that looks outside, I said, go to the inside one first. That's important because if you go inside first, it gives you, it gives you that guidance. It gives you some direction of what's actually really important to you. And then you meet, you mesh it with the world outside yourself. Too often it's done the other way around, uh, especially at, at career change times in life. People take their direction from what are the jobs that are listed, or what are jobs that are people hiring for, or what am I trained to do, or what are my parents' expectations, or what are, you know, they're coming from the outside, or what is the up elevator career now, you know, all those kind of questions, that's coming from the outside. And it's okay to think about those, but only after you've gone inside. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you one quick example, um, and it's, it's actually one of my very favorite poems. It's, it's a poem by Robert Frost, uh, where it's one of his lesser known poems, actually, but it's a poem called Two Tramps in Mud Time. Uh, not the best title, <laughs> but, but, it, but it's, it works, because the poem is about a guy who's chopping wood. And he's chopping it, not perfectly, but he's having a good time doing it. And then two tramps, who are actually loggers, out of work now, the, um, they come by and they say, hey, you know, we can do that for you. You can pay us. We'll do it much more efficiently, quicker. We'll stack you up with some wood. And he said, no, that's not the point. The point is I actually like chopping wood. So I want to chop wood. I know I'm not doing it the best, but I like it. And then he, find, he, he ends up with a wonderful last dance. You should check it out. I'm going to just paraphrase it now. But it basically it says, my goal in life is to make my work and my play one, as my two eyes are one in sight. And I've, I, I've always loved that image, because that's really what you're going for, is to have that unity of your, of your work and your play, your inside and your outside. So, well, I'm going to wrap up there, but I, I do want to say once again, um, it, it really is a thrill to be here. See your lives as a story. You get to write the story. And make it a really great one. Make it a great one. I know you will. Thanks so much.
Dean 